So we see Singer rejecting arguments that assert that there is a morally significant disanalogy between cases like Dora or Bob, where we have these clear intuitions that the moral thing to do is to act to prevent the harm, and cases like the average citizen in the average affluent contemporary society not giving or giving to charity. He rejects those disanalogies, but he considers a number of different ways they can unfold. And one thing that he talks about that is uh, sort of a disanalogy, but that I label bandwagon, is an objection that talks about whether or not, in fact, there's a relevant norm that the person is violating or whether the norm, in fact, is the person's behavior when they don't act to save a child. So the idea here is that in the Bob case, Bob and only Bob can act in a way that's going to save that child. But for any given child in peril on this objection, there are literally millions of other people who could act to save the child. And so when you look at the norm, that is what the average person does, what you discover is the average person doesn't act to save that child. And so if you think about a norm as a standard of behavior that's set by how people actually behave, what's normal, then the argument says, if we look at the norm, that standard behavior, not acting is the norm. That's the standard behavior. And so then this objection, this response to Singer would say something like, well, then why should I be judged to be acting in a immoral or morally incorrect fashion when I'm behaving just like everyone else, when I'm adhering to a behavioral norm that's common to my society? Now, Singer wants to argue that, no, look, there is a behavioral norm, what people normally do. But that behavioral norm doesn't determine the moral status of your action or your failure to act. Just like rocks have a norm, they behave in accordance with the law of universal gravitational attraction when they are released in a gravitational field. That doesn't mean that there's some moral significance to that because all rocks do it, it's the right thing for rocks to do. Instead, Singer says, what determines the moral status of that action are the morally relevant norms. And for him, that means the consequences understood through this utilitarian prism. So it isn't the popularity of the action. It isn't how many people do it versus don't do it that determines its moral status, its ethical status. Instead, it's the ethical properties, the consequences that are exhaustively and exclusively determinative of its ethical status. So he rejects arguments like this that turn on the idea of, look, uh, uh, millions of people do it, it can't be wrong. The next objection that he considers is an objection that we're sort of familiar with at this point. It looks at that central utilitarian principle, that insight that drives the utilitarian framework, and it says, look, that principle uh, is not likely to be true because it leads to unreasonable or ethically supererogatory demands. So people will look at that first premise in the simple argument and say, look, it may seem unobjectionable at first blush that if there is some moral harm that you could prevent without creating significant moral harm to yourself or others, then you ought to do it. That seems at first blush to be good, but when we actually look at that principle being systematically and uniformly followed, what we discover is that the demands that it makes on people in order for them to be morally uh, praiseworthy or at least not morally blameworthy agents are just so dramatic, so above what you could reasonably expect of people, that there's clearly going to be something wrong with that principle as opposed to the people's actions. This is not an appropriate standard to hold people to. And we've seen this now several times in the uh, course of the courts. And so Singer brings it up and he responds to it. Now, the way he brings up this 
objections, he starts off by uh, pointing out that it looks like this principle that you've articulated in your simple argument, that seems to demand that I donate $200. And suppose I say, okay, $200, I'll do that. Then I look at it and I go, well, you know, I was going to just donate $200 and then go to dinner, but it turns out, right, when I think about it, that the same principle that drove me to donate the original $200 tells me that dinner really isn't equivalent to the moral harm that would be caused by allowing uh, some other child to die, and so I should donate that money in the hopes that when somebody else does, it will save an additional child. I have to do that because that's what the principle tells me to do. And so anytime I have any disposable income at all, any income that isn't uh, going to be missed in such a way that it will cause positive harm to me, then I need to donate that income if it can help avoid harm to somebody else. That seems crazy. No action that doesn't put you at peril then is going to satisfy you, Peter Singer. And Singer says, look, I have two responses to this. The first response is that I'm not even holding you to the ultimate standard that I conclude in my argument. You're not even satisfying the $200 standard. So you're objecting to my argument on the grounds that it creates these ethically supererogatory demands on you. But your actions aren't actions that are being restrained by some you know, sense that you're being uh, harmed by trying to act in accordance with my principle. You're not even donating $200. And you could easily donate $200 without causing any serious uh, you know, erosion of your quality of life. And so you can make significant differences in world poverty, for example, even through these small actions of donating $20, $40, $200, and you're not doing even that. So you can't tell me I'm making too great a demand on you because, frankly, you're not doing anything. Or what you're doing is so small in comparison to what seems to be indicated that it's laughable. The second prong of his response is to go on and then push for that higher standard that's the conclusion of his argument, that all or most of people's disposable income really ought to be donated to these international aid organizations. And so he says, look, even though I do place this higher limit on what it is people ought to be doing in order to be acting ethically. It's a real limit. So it's not as though no matter what you do, it'll never be enough. There is a real limit, and the limit is pretty much all or most of your disposable income. So you're donating as much as wouldn't cause you harm or put you in peril, and you're benefiting people as a result of that. And so there is a real defined limit. It's not an uh, infinitely escalating demand that I'm making on you. The thing you're really objecting to is that that limit is higher than you would normally acknowledge or that you think is morally justified. But I've given you a principled argument for why I think it is morally justified. Namely, that it's not going to cause you any significant harm, but it is going to result in significant benefit. And so that's his response to this criticism of the utilitarian principle. His claim essentially is both that you're not living up even to ethically reasonable demands and that what you are characterizing as ethically supererogatory, above and beyond what could reasonably be expected, is really not above and beyond what could reasonably be expected. It's just above and beyond what you would like to do.